Now it says in Hebrews 11 here and verse 20. We start there. It says, by faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning the things to come. And then it says again, by faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed both sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning upon the top of his staff. So I read 21 again. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed both sons of Jacob, of Joseph, and worshipped, leaning upon the top of his staff. And then it says in verse 22, By faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his boats. Now, so there was something we found or we find here in the lives of the patriarchs that they understood. Uh, they understood the power of prophetic pronouncements at the point of death. Uh, the Bible speaks about Isaac blessing Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. And Isaac decided, when the Bible says his eyes had grown so dim that he could no longer see or recognize anyone, Isaac called Esau and said, now the process of death is setting into my body. I don't know how long I am going to be here. Therefore, you go and prepare the venison that I love, that my soul may bless thee. And then it tells us in 21, by faith, Jacob, when he was dying, in other words, Jacob was dying when he made this pronouncement. When he was dying, the Bible says that he blessed both sons of Joseph, and as he was dying, he worshipped, all right, leaned upon his staff and blessed them. So it's like you're laying upon your staff there, you are dying, you are worshipping, and then you make pronouncements concerning the future, and we found that those events came out, all right? I mean, they had nothing to do with it. That's the power of a prophetic utterance. They were not even around to orchestrate the fulfillment of those prophetic statements, all right, or, 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 or the sound that they are giving out. They were certain that the events will shape exactly or shape out exactly as they said. So they didn't, they didn't participate there. But they understood at the point of dying there that it's now time to say certain things. And then finally in 22, the Bible says, by faith also, Joseph, when he died, so he also went through this process here, of while he was dying, he made mention of the departing of the children of Israel. These were things that were to come. So it's like he, his eyes were opened up to see it. I must understand a prophet is not first a speaker. A prophet, all right, is characterized by being a seer. In the Old Testament, they were called seers. In other words, what they had wasn't the ability to talk, but the supernatural ability to see. And so what they said was what they saw. Now, 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 and what made them prophets was that they saw, all right, now anybody could just say anything, but it's because they saw something, all right, that's where the real ability was. It wasn't just in the pronouncement that's why God said these people are, are saying things that they have seen nothing. And this is by the imagination of their heart, all right, they have seen nothing. Paul said, I wasn't disobedient 
So the heavenly vision. In other words, he saw something. He told Moses, build according to the pattern that was shown ye thee on the mount. So they saw something and they built according to that or spoke according to that. So at the point where they were dying, they had visibility into the future and so they made declarations that were consistent with what they saw and those pronouncements all right, registered on the earth. So they understood something about the process there of dying. So the Bible says, by faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and even get, gave commandments concerning his bones. In other words, my bones must be carried when you are leaving. You mustn't leave it, all right, in this particular place. Now, you must imagine when Joseph was speaking about this, all right, and this happened, you know, hundreds of years later. But when he was saying this, Okay, maybe 200 years ago, but when he was saying this, uh, uh, Israel wa was at their height in Egypt. Uh, he, he was in literally in power. Okay, it was after Joseph went and died, and then another Pharaoh came that knew not Joseph. That's when the fortune of the Jews changed in Egypt. So they were at their peak here, and this man gets up at the peak of everything, and you say, look, your guys are going to leave this particular place one day, and I must have been looking at him, what really are you talking about? And that when you are living here, make sure you take my bones along with you. So they had visibility, but it came at the point of death or while they were dying. Now, so if we are going to translate this into our lives, uh, what are we saying here? Am I there for saying that the biggest prophetic utterances that you will ever have in your life, you must wait till the point where you know that you are dying before you are granted such visibility and such utterance, all right? But this was put here on purpose for us to understand something about the blessing of the death process. When a person is experiencing death, that moment is the most prophetic moment in the life of an individual. That's where you're going to have the greatest transference. That's when statements are going to be made. And those statements could be negative or positive. In other words, you can be experiencing it and you say things, all right, that are negative or have a negative connotation. Uh, and those things begin to shape things, uh, okay? I mean, there is no matter in this life here. I was telling somebody who was having problems in their marriage. I said, look, all right, Everybody goes through, or in large measure, you find out that there are many people that might have gone through things that are similar to what you've gone through, but you must understand that it's the tongue that escalates things. The Bible says, How great a fire, a little, all right, fire, or how great a fire, a little spark kindleth. And it says, Even so is the tongue, which means that every great fire you see, started as a little spark somewhere, all right, that was escalated by the talk. So what happens is, and it says the fire is fed from hell. So the enemy comes in and creates a spark inside the home, and he wants that particular thing escalated. And so you begin to amplify the problem, all right, with your words. You start, if I was a minister, actually this what happened, that said to me, that, you know, maybe we should arrange private counseling, all right? Non-visible, I understand what you're saying, counseling. He said because sometimes it's people just have to pour out what they're going through. It's because they, they can't pour it out somewhere. That's why it deteriorates. And I understood what he was saying in principle. That is, uh, it deteriorates. So people get and say what they shouldn't say. And when you make those statements now, then it becomes a massive fire. So every, every... Every war you see that was fought, all right, came as a result of escalation through words, which means that a little thing happens here and then you escalate that particular thing there. That's why people, all right, that are in leadership must have self-mastery of the temperament in the sense that they do not, they put things in proper perspective so that they don't escalate, all right, a little matter, 
that every single person goes through, all right, come, people go through it, you escalate it there, right, with your words, and then it says, then the whole cycle of nature or the human existence is set on fire by the fire of hell. In other words, the fire that hell now, all right, ignites now goes into. So it goes spiral and everything begins to burn, all right, but it starts from a small spark. So if a whole house is burning, all right, it might start from an electric spark there, but it was escalated by material that that fire caught onto, you get what I'm saying, that now blew the thing up, so the whole house begins to burn. All right, so that thing, the spark itself is not what actually caused, quote unquote, that's the root cause, but it had to be escalated, all right, by something, which means it caught on some material. Maybe the asbestos of the roof or curtains there, and then that now escalated the flames, and then it got escalated by something else, and then everything now began to spread around the entire house. Go to the gas cylinder, it exploded, and it was game over. So it says we should escalate things. That's why it says they slow to speak, all right? They slow to wrath, right? Don't escalate issues with the tongue, right? Put the thing out. It says a soft answer turneth away wrath. In other words, if you use your tongue right, you can de-escalate, all right? Things there and not allow those things to be amplified. But when you make pronouncements, for example, in a relationship like, I regret I ever set my eyes on you. It was, I mean, someone says things like, you know, I had th two other people I could choose and I made them. And when you say those kind of things, you can't call those kind of things back, right? You wound people in places where it will be very difficult, all right, for Paul to recover there. So things should be de-escalated there. But I'm saying that it's that particular point in time. And that's when people are experiencing that death. This death experience that they say this. All right, so we get to death experience here. So the death experience, right, in the New Testament now, right, we have this opportunity every day, right? Now, they waited until they were dying to now make this pronouncement. But we have it every single day, every single day, because Paul said, I die daily. In other words, every day you experience the death, all right, of Jesus Christ in you. There is the outward man that is perishing. We go through things on a daily basis through which we experience death. And when we're experiencing this death there is the time where we ought to be, right, soundly prophetic and not get negative and say the wrong things. Now, so what does it mean, this death experience? We find it in 2 Corinthians and chapter, 2 Corinthians and chapter 4. And it tells us that in verse 6, it says, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined or shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. So there is the light that comes from the knowledge of of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. So that knowledge is in the face of Jesus or the countenance of Jesus. Now, so let's bring this so people can understand what he's saying. The face of God, when he says, seek my face, the meaning of that word face means seek what are my thoughts concerning that particular thing. Uh, what am I thinking, all right? What do I have on my mind there? Seek my face. So if a person says, well, I have three job offers, I want to seek the face of God, what it means is I want to find out what are the thoughts of God concerning this particular thing. I want to know what God is thinking. So here is the deal. If you come to meet somebody or you just meet a friend and you say, you know, I have three job offers, all right, you just tell the person, well, one, all right, it's about two kilometers from my house, they are paying me, 800,000. The second is about four doors away, uh, they are paying me 500,000. And then the other one, all right, is I will have to almost travel, car for about 45 minutes, all right, and go across town, but they'll pay me a million. The minute you tell somebody that, they start thinking about 
what they are going to, if it were them, what they would do. So when you, if that person doesn't talk, you don't ask that person. Now that person has thoughts concerning it based on their experience, right? That person can tell, so let's assume the person just heard, the person can tell somebody else, I think they should take that other one here because, you know, in the past I've gone through all of this, I've gone traveled 45 minutes by the time you go through the stress. So they have thoughts. So what he's saying, when you seek the face of God, right, you want to find out what a God thinking, all right, concerning that particular thing. Because you can't just open the book of Luke and know when you're just reading the scriptures there, just to know exactly except you ask him. So he reveals his thoughts. So that as you are studying, you can see from something that plays out in the scripture, all right, he leads you there, you can see what God is thinking about in that particular situation there. Maybe it takes you to the life of David, and David made a decision or something in scripture, and then you see the thoughts of God, and then he said, this is what I'm going to do. So when you have the thoughts of God, you have the knowledge of God's glory. Glory means who God is in essence and what he does. You have that knowledge and it's light. That's what he's saying here. So he says, you, God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. Uh, now the power of that is, w when the earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep, God said, let there be light. In other words, let it be clear what we really want to do. Uh, there's chaos here and there's darkness. Uh, before we do anything, let us have the vision clear. What are we building? So he saw the earth clear. He saw the waters gathered. He had the perfect design. He saw how man was to live on the earth. He saw, all right, that certain functions were to be carried out, right, on the earth. Uh, he saw them and he said, look, let us create somebody in our own image to be able to manage this earth, all right? And the role of this person or this people will be to do this. Now, what he saw, the plan there was clear. He said, we are going to need certain animals to, to, to make what we are seeing come to pass. And so he called out every animal. Now, God could have called out more things, but he called out only what fitted into that light that he saw that this is what we want. So it's like an architect, if he looks at it and he says, you show him some land and he says, well, we want to build an auditorium here. He looks at it and says, let there be light. So he gets the auditorium. He knows exactly what every room, all right, we used for. This will be a conference room. This will be here. This will be this. This will be that. This will be this. And so the kind of materials they're going to bring in is according to that vision that they have. So everything God was calling forth was according to the vision that he had. So when he says you are in a situation and says, God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shone inside your heart, it means he makes it clear to you, very clear, what he is thinking about that situation and what will be the outcome of that particular thing this is what, all right, I want to bring out so that, right, you can now begin to speak, all right, according to those things that I have shown you. So he went on and said, but we have this treasure, which is this light, in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Then he said, we are troubled on every side yet not distressed. We are perplexed, not in despair, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Then he said, always bearing about in the body the dying of our Lord Jesus Christ, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal body. So he's talking about the process of dying. For we which live are always delivered to this experience of death. For Jesus' sake, that's the life, which means the intention is that the life, that's the only way the life of Jesus will be made manifest or visible in our mortal flesh. So then death walketh in us, 
but life in you. And then it goes to that same thing. We having the spirit of faith, as it is written, I believe, therefore have I spoken. We believe also, therefore we speak, knowing that he that raised up Jesus, which means the same spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead, shall make manifest in your mortal flesh the life of Jesus. So the way the Holy Spirit does it is through the spirit of faith, you believe and therefore you speak. But the moment he does it is when you are dying. Which means this is a precious moment. It's not a moment. It cannot happen outside the experience of death. It's a powerful moment. And one of, uh, one of the things we must understand about spiritual things, even about life, is the power of moments, timing, right? Uh, there are certain times that certain things can happen, and outside those times, they cannot happen. All right? So to everything, there's a time. So there's timing. When the time, that's why Jesus said you have missed the time of your visitation. There's timing, all right, in the realm of the Spirit. And so we must understand the power there of moment. So when is this death moment that these patriarchs understood that the minute they were dying, they said, it's time now to prophesy life. The minute they were experiencing death, they said, this is the moment. We can't do this outside the moment. If we make statements outside when we are dying, it won't have the carry, the weight, and the power. So you must understand, all right, this moment you experience, which means in verse 10, always bearing about in the body the dying of our Lord Jesus. We that live, in verse 11, are always delivered unto death. When are you delivered unto death? It says in verse 8, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, which means when you are perplexed, when something happens and you are perplexed, it says cast down, all right, but not destroyed. When you are cast down, something happens and you are cast down. When you are persecuted, that's when you are experiencing that dying there, and that is the moment to rise up in the spirit of faith and exchange, all right, with words of faith, death for life. Now, if you don't do it at that particular point in time, in other words, if you, uh, you walk out of this place and you're all happy, you came for a service, and, you know, you are all encouraged, and you are saying that, you know, I know I'm going to be successful. I know I'm going to be successful. I know I'm going to be successful. That's fine. All right? And every time we declare, you know, the Bible says, preach the word in season or proclaim the word in season and out of season. Now, you can be proclaiming something in season, which means, all right, there's no contradiction to that word. It seems like it's going to work. But then there's when you are saying it out of season when it doesn't look like, all right, it's going to work. And the truth about the matter is that we say the word in season, and it doesn't work at that time, but it only starts working when we start saying it out of season. But we say it, we have to say it in season so that we are ready to say it when we're out of season. Do you get what I'm saying here? But it's when you are saying it out of season that it starts working. Which means the word only begins to become visible when death is working in you. Which means when you are cast down is when the word can manifest. If you are not cast down and you are just saying, well, fine. But you are building up yourself for that particular moment. Right? Which means that when you are discouraged, that's the moment. And many times that's when people say the wrong things. Which means they are saying the right things until the wrong thing happens. Then they start saying the wrong thing. And they say that, well, I've been saying it, right? But they don't understand that. It, it's like they told Esther, you are in the kingdom for such a time as this. In other words, you are positioned in the kingdom for such a time as this. So if I've been calling into existence those things that be not as though they are, and I'm encouraged in my room, all right, that's what Paul was saying. He said, stand fast. He said, haven't done all stand. He says, then stand in the evil day. 
All right? The real day you are supposed to stand is the evil day. But if you don't stand, if you have not been standing before the evil day, there is no way you are going to stand on that evil day. But you are standing before the evil day to be able to stand on that evil day. Because it will make mean nothing if you are not standing in that evil day. So when the word begins to work, so you must understand the power of that moment there. Now, let me show you how powerful this is. Because people can say, well, I was practicing the word of God. I was practicing the word of God. I was doing my confession, doing my confession. And they are correct. And they made their confession, let's say, let's say they made it 80% of the time they did it. But the 5% that will count for something, they didn't know that that's when, which means, you know, I, I, I mean, I mean, that 5%, they didn't understand the power of the moment. I said, well, but I said it, it. But that 5%, all right, will, means more than in terms of the impact that the world will have than during that time. I mean, I was watching something, and it, yeah, but that's how life is. It's, it's about moments. And, and if you really don't understand moments, then you miss out on life. That's why Jesus said you miss the time of a visitation. If you don't know, you think, you think, you know, that this thing, I mean, you, you must be ready. That's why the Bible speaks about five virgins, or right, ten virgins, foolish, and that, the power of the moment, that that moment came. It says, once I knock on the door, immediately. It says, when the harvest comes, immediately they put in the sickle. So they understand the power of the moment. They don't miss that particular moment. Because you miss that moment, the door can get shot. So, I mean, I was watching this, and I saw this on DS, and I just saw it, and I decided to follow up on it, all right? Because I saw a lady, she broke the world record, and I found it fascinating, all right? She's one, one of the others I do, and she ran, and she didn't know she had broken the world record, and then it was her friend that tapped her and said, you've broken the world record, and then she was, so I just said, let me just watch the full race. So I went on YouTube, all right, because I have a curious mind there, just to find out the story behind it. And what had happened, and I said, this is life. If you don't get it, then you feel life has, has you know, has cheated all right, you, all right, you just feel. What had happened to her was that she ran, all right, in one of these, their um, athletics meet, their Grand Prix when they run in circuit, and she broke the world record in 110 meters hurdles. The world record. She was American. And in the finals, there were five Americans. She came first, broke the world record. But two weeks before that was when they were doing the U.S., and they were saying this, the U.S. trial, for the Olympics, which was in a few months' time. In that race, she made a mistake and came fifth. Technically, she's the fastest American in 110 hurdles. Two weeks after, she broke the world record. But she was not going to the Olympics because the race that will determine who will go to the Olympics, she made a mistake. Now, there's nothing like I'm sorry, let us ring on. Everybody going to the Olympics knew this lady is better than all of us. But if you miss it in these 10 seconds, you have wasted four years as far as training for Olympics is concerned. So when you get to that moment, are you following what I'm saying here? When you get to, you know, when I was young in 1984 Olympics, all right, you know, we run 400 meters. I think we had the innocent Benike and one other guy. And they ran semi-final. They came first. Another Nigerian came second. And when it was time for final, we were confident of, of gold or silver. I was case scenario, bronze. My brother told me, he said, the Americans know the power of moment. He said, watch what's going to happen in the final. That they know it's not the semi-final that counts. They know it is the 45 seconds on the final. That when they get down on the tracks, they will remember their grandmother, great grandmother, remember everybody. And when they get up, they will know that nothing else matters but these 45 seconds. What you did, you cannot come and say, but I tried in that meet, I, I came second. It doesn't matter. Nobody remembers what you ran in Zurich, it doesn't count. Nobody remembers Hamburg meet, you came second. Nobody, you came first. No, it doesn't count. What they remember, is Atlanta 19, what they, that's what they remember. And so you must understand, all right, the power of the moment. And these people knew that when they were dying was the moment. 